Amongst politicians, rulers, and in fact, all of the elites and the ruling class around the world, it has been demanded by the people to see for their constituents, for their people, for their society. Although this is a struggle which the modern day world faces every day in times of ancient Mexico and Central America, it was actually a given. Yes, rulers and governments amongst native nations of the Anahuac, wrongfully named Mesoamerica by liberal academics, were expected to see for their people. It was a given. Contrary to the evolution of other societies from our new world like Europe, in ancient Mexico, our ancestors had no conflict or struggle of societies, no struggle of classes or ethnicities within a state. And this lack of struggle of classes was due to the intrinsic idea, which was already a given, that the Tlatuani, the Ahau, the Calzonsin, the authority figure, the king, the ruler, the head of state, would see and provide for their people, just as the people will see and provide for the maintenance of the government apparatus. From the perspective of the monarch, she or he would lead society. Yes, women ruled back in ancient Mexico. And I know this is a big shock for many people, but women did exercise power. They were also the only ones capable of giving birth to nations or to royal lineages. Likewise, women were the only ones that could bring death to a nation. Thus, giver and taker of life. Such was the importance of women in politics and rulership. From the perspective of the people, the majority, they would actively engage through the tequio. The tequio was the system of community participation. Because back then in ancient Mexico, the government didn't open bids for private contractors. It was the people themselves, led by the elite, who built their own roads, tall buildings, waterworks, universities all infrastructure and services. And this work, although seemingly free or borderline communist from the eyes of a Westerner, had in fact payment in return for the people, the unconditional service of the ruling class. Monarchy and the ruling class were tied to their people, not to their interests or wealth. And this was because of the Tecchio symbiosis, the Tecchio given by Masewaltin, the people, and the leadership and majesty given by the Pipiltin, the elite. Pelashila, although queen of the Zapotecs, queen by marriage, she was born a Mexica Aztec, originally named Coyolicatzin in Nahuatl language, the language of the mighty Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance is wrongfully known today as the Aztec Empire. She was named Coyolicatzin, Cotton Ball, because her skin was whiter than the rest of the people. She was a daughter of Kina Huitzot, Tlatuani of the Mexica Aztecs. Princess Coyolicatzin knew her fair skin and exotic beauty could be an asset, but amid her singular facade, Coyolicatzin was thoughtful, resourceful, and above all, intelligent and her intelligence was without a doubt proven. As the Triple Alliance attempted to secure more open and faster trading routes to their faraway dominions in Central America, they were halted by the Zapotec army. The siege of Yengola ensued a lengthy war of attrition where neither the Mexica Aztecs nor the Zapotecs seemed to get a break. What we know, historically, is that both sides were truly desperate and that both capitals, Mexico Tenochtitlan and Saachila, would literally do anything to win the war. Now, we don't truly know how or why, but somehow, by the way this was reported, but somehow, Princess Coyolicatzin paid a visit to King Cosijoes of Saachila while he was taking a bath in his pool. The whole setting was quite enticing for the Zapotec king, 
but far more tempting was the idea brought by Princess Koyolikatsin, a plan to marry her in order to broker a cease to hostilities to avoid more blood being spilled. Peace. Peace between the Mexica Aztecs and the Zapotecs. Impossible. But that was not all. Princess Koyolikatsin suggested the idea must come from the Zapotec side, from Cosijoesa himself. Hence, her father, King Awitzotl, would bend to such a strategic alliance and accept peace. But her father would certainly choose the bride. And the problem was, no one back home in Mexico Tenochtitlan knew Princess Coyolicatzin's knock to the baths of Cosijoesa, King of the Zapotecs. So she instructed him to send Zapotec emissaries to the Mexica Aztec capital and that this would be the only condition in this peace treaty for the envoys to choose the bride for their king. But how would the Zapotec ambassadors know who to choose? Quite easy, she lifted her hand and arm showing him her fair skin and there, quite contrasting, was a large black mole. It was the only way to identify her, since you know, back then there was no Instagram. So everything happened exactly like Coyolicatzin foresaw. Peace was achieved and she became Queen Pelashila of the Zapotecs. Pelashila being the translation from Nahuatl to Ben Sa'a, the language of the Zapotecs. But remember we were talking about politics at the beginning? And especially where loyalties amongst rulers should fall. Sooner or later, Belashila would have to face the dilemma. For her people, the Mexicastics, through secret envoys, gave the heads up of an incoming attack against Saachila, the Zapotec capital, her adoptive capital. The onslaught would be such that they needed Belashila's aid from the inside, not only concerning about military intelligence, but logistics as well. This is the Belashila dilemma. Where should the loyalty of the ruler fall if not to her people? The problem is that both sides, the Mexica Aztec on one side and the Zapotec on the other, were her people. Back then in ancient Mexico, being a ruler, a monarch, a royal, a pili, a noble meant something, unlike today, where Mexico is knee deep in systemic corruption that has led to social atrophy and the breaking of society, where violence and nepotism has tore the fabric of society itself. We did peace with the left and the right, both the left and the right. But back then, the majesty of being a Pili was the endearing commitment for their people, and to break that link would erode into descending chaos of struggle of classes, struggle of societies. That's why the bond was never severed between both the Masewaltin and the Pipiltin. The question was, what would Pelashila do? If she would help her family, it would be nepotism. If she would help her husband and her city, it would mean treason to her kin, to her Aztec Mexica people, to her family. But so would be the other way around. Hence the dilemma for the queen. So how did she solve it? In today's eyes, we tend to see loyalties fall for a specific group, a flag, an ethnicity, a homeland, a religion, and even workplace above everything else. Rarely today do people exercise independent thought for the greater good. It is said by Westerners, Europeans, liberal academic scholars, and even by Mexicans that back then we were primitive because we were tribal and hence backwards. But actually, it is today that we've become more tribal than ever. Literally, people spend their lives on the web, fighting each other over celebrities they will never meet. They waste their time rooting for a sports team Immigrants keep waving the flags of the very countries that were originally killing them. 
people have become so numb that when they reach government, because remember nowadays we have democracies, so when people reach the echelons of power, their instinct goes directly to tribalism, in politics, in economics, in religion, in many pivotal issues, and thus sinking today's world into the abyss of sectarianism and divide. Everyone's just fighting everyone, haven't you noticed? This mayhem has reached even science and education. Was Queen Pelashila and the rest of the Pipiltin, the ruling class, tribal and dividing back then? Well, for starters, there was a reason they were the leaders, the guides, because they were wise and empathetic. Wise and empathetic rulers, more than 5,000 years free of struggle of classes, attest to this. There was no socialism, because there was no need for socialism. There was no capitalism, because there was no need for capitalism. Socialism and capitalism were brought to this our old world from Europe, from their historical experiences. It wasn't ours. The native people of ancient Mexico, or the Americas for that matter. For Pelagila's dilemma, to choose her own king, her own flag to which she was born, her family, her own ethnicity, the Nahua ethnicity, it would debase her to nepotism, a form of political corruption. But also, she would be ignoring the greater good as a pili, a noble, as a royal. Remember, the Pipiltin lived to aid the people, not to help themselves out of the people for their own political, personal, gender, or ethnic advancement. Pelashila's dilemma. To politically align with the nation that saw her born? To personally seek power that could be gained by helping her father? To take his husband, King Cosijuesa, out of the picture for her to rule as absolute queen? To be biased to her own ethnic origin, language, and culture? How did Queen Pelagila solve this political dilemma? She stuck to her values as a Pipiltin, her royal values. Much has been discussed about the values and efforts made by the Masihualtin, the people in general from that time, the bulk of the population. But little has anyone analyzed the Pipiltin values. Majesty, guidance, setting the example, leading by walking the talk. Queen Pelashila made her decision. She comforted with his husband and explained the plan of the Mexica Aztecs on rolling against him and his people, thus foiling her father's plans. She told him and she told the Zapotec people the machinations from her own kin and even took action against it. Pelashila did not choose tribalism. Pelashila did not choose division amongst her constituents. Queen Pelashila chose to be a ruler for all, not for the few that thought like her, or looked like her, or spoke her same language, or for those who were her family. Queen Pelashila chose unity amongst her constituents against all odds. History serves as a beacon to lighten the path to our future. Without it, it's just meaningless dates and spicy anecdotes. And history should especially mean more in these democratic times, where now just about anyone can step up and rule the destinies of millions. Democracy has gone so far that we now even have dictators and supreme leaders that can be anyone with the biggest guns or thicker wallet. Literally. And not just states but corporations now where we are on the way to become a society like the movie WALL-E where companies will become the new governments, the new states and CEOs, the new kings. Thus, the people should learn from past political experiences because hey come on, didn't I just say anyone can now become a ruler? So that's why everyone should know the history of politics from ancient Mexico, from the Anahuac, 
to gain insight on overlooked political philosophies that actually worked for the good of the population, not for the good of a political party or ideology, but for the people. Pelagila's dilemma can be applied to any country, to any government, and any political or community leader, only, only if they follow it truthfully as Queen Pelagila did. The problem would be how today's system would react if one would behave with majesty in the good of the people, instead of a political creed, political colors, or even personal bias. Today our political systems separate, not unite. The dilemma of Pelagila, indigenous queen of Saachila, should be tried in a world where all has failed to unite towards a common cause. Perhaps, just perhaps, instead of being the Pelagila dilemma, as I pointed, it would surely be the Pelagila solution. The solution to end political jammed idleness. The solution that came from a daring girl once named Coyolicatzi. Queen Pelagila.